Therefore, it is now time for question period. The Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Thank you and good morning, Speaker. My question is for the Acting Premier. Yesterday's election document is proof this government will say anything, yep. do anything, and promise anything to cling to power. The government promised to balance the budget. Instead, their desire to cling to power will doom Ontario to six more years of deficits just to announce election promises that no one trusts they'll ever keep. Two billion dollars in new taxes on families and businesses. Skyrocketing debt that will further dilute the, the services families need. Speaker, does this government really believe that votes are for sale in Ontario? Here, here. <clears throat> Mr. Speaker, this government believes that the priorities of Ontarians are first and foremost in any work that we do. In the last number of budgets that I've had the privilege of delivering, this is a six now, we built in progressive measures while still growing the economy. This budget is about promoting more care when it comes to health care, mental health and addiction, child care, and seniors care. And Mr. Speaker, on the other side, we're implementing measures to stimulate growth, to support businesses, to continue to be the leanest government anywhere in Canada, and to grow our economy stronger. Mr. Speaker, the members opposite have voted against those very progressive measures. We have balanced the budget. We have a surplus of $600 million, and we're going to continue Answer. fighting for all Ontarians. Thank you. Supplementary. Back to the Acting Premier. Ontario families and businesses will be paying billions more in taxes as a result of this throw it against the wall and see what sticks election document. 1.8 million people will be paying more in taxes. This is a personal income tax increase that will take $275 million out of families' pockets. Wow. The government is adding to the employer health tax, hurting 20,000 businesses. They will each pay $2,400 more dollars a year. That's $45 million in taxes. Another Speaker, hit. if the government is raising taxes by $2 billion just weeks before an election, just imagine what they'll do if they wow. got re-elected. Just imagine. Thank you. Just Mr. Speaker, in the 2016 budget, we made it clear that we're going to eliminate the surtax, a hidden tax on tax to benefit Ontarians. Over 700,000 more will be paying less. But more importantly, Mr. Speaker, the member opposite talks about people's money in people's pockets. In this budget, we are providing $17,000 for child who require child care, over $1,000 more for seniors who require support, Mr. Speaker. We'll continue to provide help where needed especially when those with need developmental services. The member opposite is talking about mirroring the federal government's uh, it, it, tax provisions for the highest payers, Mr. Speaker. Answer. Obviously, he thinks it's okay for the biggest governments, the biggest banks in our community, not to pay their okay. fair share. We're allowed to Stop the clock. Stop the clock. I, I've heard a few comments from the uh, opposition side that uh, I would normally jump up and say that it's not to be said and withdrawn. I will from now on. People know better than that. Final supplementary. Back to the Acting Premier. Uh, one of the key admissions, Speaker, on page 224 is that there are, quote, efficiencies to be found in the Ontario government. What does that mean? $1.425 billion in efficiencies, to be precise. So over four years, that first year alone of efficiencies equals $6 billion. Now, when you add the second, third, and fourth year, that's $14.4 billion annualized efficiencies the Liberals are promising. What's that mean? When the PCs say efficiency, they scream cuts, but it's in their own budget. Speaker, if this undisciplined, spendthrift Russia. government can show $14.4 billion in efficiencies, can you imagine what Doug Ford and the PCs are going to find? Here, here. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you. Minister. Hey, Mr. Speaker, there's the crux of the matter. 
We have made it clear we are the leanest government anywhere in Canada. We find transformations where possible. We find savings of almost $2 billion every year, and we exceed our targets year over year. That's how we slay the deficit, and that's how we come to balance. And we are going to come back to balance because we put a lot of prudence and reserves into our system. They're not just sawing into fat, Mr. Speaker. If they're taking our numbers and they're saying they're going to be able to provide even more cuts, because that's what they're talking about. Cuts to services and programs, they're going to saw into bone. They're going to put people in harm's way. They're going to put our economy in harm's way. We are going to continue to support, support those that need it, and we're going to grow the economy, Mr. Speaker. After rule one, we're in warnings. We're in warnings. New question, the Leader of the Opposition. Questions for the Acting Premier, uh, who just admitted to $14.4 billion in cuts of real concern to Ontario businesses and families should be this government's dismal economic outlook. The budget projects $1 billion less in corporate revenues every year due to, quote, increased economic uncertainty caused by the U.S. corporate tax cuts. So the U.S. cuts taxes to make them more competitive, and our government raises taxes. Speaker, their answer is to run us deep into deficits, hike taxes, and make life more unaffordable for families. Speaker, why is this government doing the absolute opposite of what is needed to create jobs in Ontario? Well, let's talk about making life more affordable for Ontarians, yeah, Mr. Let's Speaker. Do that. Let's do that. This budget is all about putting more money in people's pockets. We're providing free preschool. A member from the PN Carleton is warned. Finish, please. We're providing pre preschool child care. That's seventeen thousand dollars per child for a young family, Mr. Speaker. We're providing. OHIP Plus, a universal pharma care for every child, every young adult 25 and under, and every senior 65 and over. Here. We're now providing an Ontario Drug and Benefit Plan that will provide $700 per family that otherwise would not have had it. We know we're lowering the commuting costs with the uh, transit system here in the Southern Corridor, but in the far north, we're providing even more support Answer. to help them as well with free tuition for every student that qualifies now that we've increased it. Mr. Yep. Speaker, they're going to vote against the people of Ontario. Thank you. Supplementary. Back to the acting premier. As CTV reported, quote, this budget had nothing for small businesses. Those owners were looking for some kind of relief. In the 2019 budget, they got nothing. Wow. And as the Coalition of Concerned Manufacturers rightly said, quote, true to form, the Wynn Liberals did not support Ontario businesses in the budget. Not acceptable, not right not going to be tolerated. Not Quote, a, not a, not. This government has teamed up with Prime Minister Trudeau to attack small businesses. Yep. Yep. This Shame. isn't acceptable. Shame. Speaker, why have the Liberals turned their backs on the engine of Ontario's here, economy? Here. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, the province of Ontario is the engine of Canada. Yeah. We provide well over 40 per cent of, Canadians, of Canada's economy. We have the lowest unemployment rate in two decades. We provide over 100, 811,000 net new jobs, and in this budget, we're supporting 140,000 jobs every year yeah. through our record levels of infrastructure spending to support businesses and to ensure that we are competitive. That's why we're providing for more apprenticeship programs, skills and training. That's why we're accelerating our Jobs and Prosperity Fund to attract that foreign direct investment. We are still tops in North America when it comes to that, Mr. Speaker. Again, the member opposite talks about small business. Of course, we're supporting small business. Even the employer health tax is supporting them, yes, and we have reduced their tax by 22 percent. The member opposite recognizes or should recognize that the private sector matters to Thank you. Final supplementary. Thank you, uh, Speaker. Back to the Acting Premier. Ontario families aren't the only ones concerned. This government's own expert witness at the pre-budget uh, pre hearings, Craig Alexander of the Conference Board of Canada, weighed in yesterday. He said, quote, there really isn't a rationale for running deficits right now. Douglas Porter, the chief economist, uh, economist at BMO, said, quote, ideally, you would like to see a government 
uh, whose finances are in relatively strong shape. When Stop the clock, please. Minister of Infrastructure is warned. Finish, please. Ideally, you would like to see government finances in relatively strong shape when we hit that heavy weather. Quote, Only the PCs will bring back manufacturing jobs and restore fiscal responsibility right. in Ontario. That's Speaker, right. why is this government writing checks that are going to bounce? Here, here. Good question. Good question. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. The member from Barrie is warned. Minister. All right, Mr. Speaker, here's a history lesson on the PCs. In the last 40 years, there's only been eight balanced budgets. The PCs only delivered three, Mr. Speaker, and we did the rest. When it came time to support our manufacturing sector that was in trouble during the greatest recession in history, they said it was corporate welfare, Mr. Speaker. They did not support our auto industry. We were there for the When it came to Stelco, we supported our steel industry. And when it comes to servicing the debt, of which almost three quarters of it is for infrastructure and capital investment, they are voting against supporting construction of roads and bridges and transit that matter to our competitiveness. And our interest on debt to service it is low today Answer. than it was when they were in power by almost a half, Mr. Speaker. New question, the leader of the third party. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question is to the Acting Premier. Can the Acting Premier tell us what it costs to get a regular cleaning done at the dentist? Thank you. Acting Premier. It's a fair question, and I understand where the member is coming from. We recognize that dental plans are important, especially for those that don't have it. It is why we've introduced the Ontario Drug and Dental Plan for those that don't have those benefits. Exactly. We are going to continue to support our young people through these programs. We've provided now for free pharmacare for a much larger formularity than the member opposite was suggesting, and we're doing that for seniors as well. And when it comes to those that don't have those benefit plans, we're starting off by providing them at least $700 per family. We know more can be done, and we're going to continue to support that program. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, Speaker, I can let him know that it's at least $100 for a regular cleaning. Can the acting premier tell us how much it costs to have a cavity filled, Speaker? Thank you, Minister. Mr. Speaker, you know what it costs for a young family with toddlers? and they need to have them put in daycare and they can't afford it, $17,000 is what this province is going to be able to provide for those families. And we're going to continue supporting those families with those that are most in need. And I recognize that we can always do more, and we are going to continue to build upon the very things that we put forward, and we're going to continue providing more, more health care, more, more pharma care, more seniors care, more mental health and addictions, and more supports for families and putting more money in their pockets. Thank you. Final supplementary. Well, Speaker, a cavity would be about $200, so that's about $300 total for a regular cleaning and to have one cavity filled, a pretty standard visit to the dentist. Can the Acting Premier tell us, Speaker, how the Liberal plan to reimburse $50 per child per year for dental work in Ontario would cover this one average visit to the dentist? Thank you. Minister. So that family that has a young child who needs cavities filled will now have more money in their pocket because they're saving $17,000 on child care, Mr. Speaker. We're supporting the families of this province, and they should be supporting this budget as well. New question, the leader of the third party. Thank you, Speaker. My next question is to the acting premier. Can the acting premier tell us how much it costs to have a tooth pulled? Thank you. <laughs> Minister? The member again is asking about the requirements to enhance our dental plans. Yes. I get it. Yes. We're providing lots of support for the families of this yes. province, including dental plans. Yes. We will continue to support them. And if you want to pull my teeth, by all means, <laughs> I recognize that the province needs to support the people of this province, and we are doing just that in this budget and in our plan. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. 
supplementary well, question. Speaker, I can enlighten the Acting Premier. For a simple extraction, it's about $140. For something more complicated, it can be as much as $250. Does the Acting Premier know how much it costs to have four impacted wisdom teeth removed or a root canal on a back tooth done, Speaker? Thank you. Does the member opposite know what it costs to provide drug plans for those that are chronically in need of that plan, which you are not providing in your plan? That is money that will go to the people of our province. And as I say again, seniors are going to get $1,000 more because of the programs we're putting in, and young families are going to get substantively more in order to support their children. I understand. We need to provide and we want to support the people of this province. We are having putting forward a plan that is sustainable and is costed, Mr. Speaker, in order to enable them to get the services and programs they need. Thank you. Final supplementary. Speaker, it's about $1,000 to have wisdom te teeth taken out, and that is without any complications at all. A root canal, canal on a back tooth speaker can cost as much as $900. Can the Acting Premier tell us how the Liberal plan to reimburse just $300 for an average Ontario adult per year would cover the cost of a $900 root canal? Sure. Mr. Mr. Speaker, the member again is talking about the cost to families on a, a range of issues. It's not just dental plans that cost families more money. There is a degree of burden that we're trying to support, and they're shouldering that burden. But families, as well as businesses, do encumber costs. We in this side of the House want to make certain that we take a balanced approach to offset some of those costs in order for them to be better off. The net benefit from this plan is more money in their pockets to support by way of their savings. The member opposite can pinpoint on one particular instance, and if they have low income and if they're unable to support themselves, or if there's emergency requirements, we do have universal health care, and we're sustaining it, and we're building upon it. The member opposite knows that. There are other issues that are in this budget that they should be supporting for the benefit of the people of this Thank province. Thank you. New question, the member from Sault Ste. Marie. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Acting Premier. On page 191 of the budget, the Liberal projections are astounding. They are flat out admitting that their policies are going to kill job creation. In fact, under the Liberals, job creation would be cut in half within the next three years. Northern Ontario needs more jobs, not less, Mr. Speaker. My question is how can this Liberal government write off job creation for the sake of trying to win an election? Thank you. Acting Premier. Minister of Economic Development. Minister of Economic Development. Thanks very much, Speaker. I thank the member for his question. I'm a little bit confused as to why he could take uh, the content from yesterday's budget and come to any other conclusion other than the fact that our government, our Premier, continues to be uh, extremely uh, positive and supportive of programs and funding that will help support, on a strategic basis, uh, help support more job creation in this province. I know I've said this many times in the legislature, Speaker. But since the depths of the recessionary low a decade ago, our province has created more than 800,000 jobs. Our unemployment rate today stands lower than it has at any other point for the last 17 years. We've been below the national average for about 33 or 34 consecutive months, Speaker, and in part, that's because of the strategic investments that our government has made through programs like the Jobs and Prosperity Fund. And in yesterday's budget, Speaker, which I'd be happy to elaborate on in the follow-up the follow-up answer, there was significant yes, more funding over the next three years provided oh, to yeah. continue awesome. to help us strategically invest awesome. and the Thank people you. that are helping build up this province. And I'll elaborate in a quick Thank moment. Supplementary. Thank you. Uh, back to the acting premier. Again, the Liberals come clean with another astounding fact. They're admitting that we will be less competitive than the United States. They cite recent tax reforms in the U.S. as just one of the examples why. I represent a border city, and our economies are intrinsically linked, Mr. Speaker. We can't afford liberal policies that will drive jobs across the border instead of keeping them in Ontario. My question, Mr. Speaker, is why will this Premier accept the fact that U.S. tax reforms will make us less competitive? Why will she not help to make Ontario prosperous and open for business? Thank you. Minister. Yes, Speaker, I really don't understand how a province could be considered any more open for business than Ontario, given the incredible economic story that we have to tell here in this province, Speaker. So specifically, specifically in the budget that was tabled yesterday, over the next three years, there will be $935 million if the budget's passed in new investments to specifically support 
something that we're calling the Good Jobs and Growth Plan speaker. So, for example, in order to help build Ontario's talent advantage, we'll be investing $411 million over three years wow. specifically to work closely with employers, colleges and universities to help people find a job, retain that job or get a better job speaker. We're going to be renewing the Jobs and Prosperity Fund with an increase of $900 million over the next 10 years wow. for a grand total of $3.2 billion wow. since 2014-2015, Speaker. Wow. And there are a series of other funds that will be embedded within that extended or expanded Jobs and Prosperity Fund. All of this, Speaker, is part of the reason. This is part of how we've set the table over the last number of years for that economic success story that Ontario has become. Answer. We'll continue to make the right investment, Speaker. I would call on the member from Sault Ste. Marie and the Ontario Conservative Party to stand with us and support our business community so they can Thank continue you. to create jobs in this province. Thanks very much, Speaker. New question, the member from Tomiskamy. My question is to the Acting Premier. I'm currently the agriculture critic for the NDP, and I'm proud to represent a rural riding, but I will always be a farmer. So I listened very closely to the finance minister's speech, and not once did I hear the word agriculture or farmer or farm. So I read the document. I read the document. Order. Again, though the text of the document, those words were missing. Why has it, does it seem that the Liberal government is forgetting the cornerstone of our agri-food industry? I'm going to allow the supplementary to go to the Minister of Agriculture, but let me very clearly state this. Even in the speech yesterday, I talked at length about the tremendous diversification of our economy and the importance for us to continue to advance in those investments. One of the biggest ones of all is agri-food processing. Yep. And we have a fund, a beverage and food fund, that's all about agriculture in our rural communities. We introduced it in the budget it's meant to ensure that we continue to grow that, and it's one of the biggest contributors to our GDP. I recognize that. Furthermore, we just recently announced support for rural communities through engagement in our horse racing industry to secure that market as well. And when you look at all the products that are produced by this province, best quality around the world, it includes as well as agriculture and fishing that are major exports, and we recognize that importance, and that's why we're working alongside other markets to ensure that we can continue to support the industry. Mr. Speaker, we're very proud yes, of our agricultural sector and the people of Ontario. And once again, to the Acting Premier, for years farmers have been asking for uh, uh, an increase to the RMP program, which has been capped by the government. It was missing from the budget. For years, they've been waiting for an expansion of the production insurance program. Funds for that were missing for the budget. The only really significant mention directly to the farm sector was that you were going to lobby your federal cousins for assistance for the damage that was going to be caused to the agri-food sector by the, TPT, by the TPP. So you're asking for the feds to support agriculture in the budget document. Where is your support for the agricultural sector? Thank you. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you. Minister of Agriculture. Minister of Agriculture, Food well, and Rural Affairs. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And it goes without saying the profound respect that I have for the member for Tobisbing Cochrane. But let me, uh, let me share a few things. He talks about risk management program in the province of Ontario. We've ensured that there will be $100 million each and every year for that program. At the advice of the stakeholders, we're doing a review of the RMP program in the province of Ontario to make sure that every one of those dollars goes where it's needed within the non-supply managed sector of Ontario's ag economy. It was Ontario that took the initiative on a national basis to reform the National Business Risk Management wow. Program for farmers here in Ontario to make sure that they meet Ontario farmer needs in the non-supply managed sector. There has never been anybody more that I've had the opportunity to defend Ontario's supply managed sector, whether it's talks in Mexico City, whether it was talks in Montreal, whether it's talks that are upcoming in Washington, because we want to make sure that that stays intact. The, the With regards to our Jobs and Prosperity Fund, we'll continue to invest in the agri-food sector in Ontario. 
which is a driver, the largest sector in Ontario's economy Answer. today, $37.5 billion, 800,000 jobs, predicated really on 50,000 family successful. farms Thank in you. the province of Ontario. Very good. Very good. New question, the member from Davenport. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. My question this morning is to the Minister of Finance, and I want to start off by congratulating him on tabling his sixth budget. The budget that was released yesterday has a focus on care and opportunity for the people of Ontario, and it includes significant new investments in health care, child care, home care, and mental health. The budget also focuses on initiatives that make life more affordable and provide more financial security during this time of rapid economic change. On this side of the House, we've taken significant measures to invest in more care and build opportunity for the people of Ontario. And at my budget breakfast this morning with stakeholders from Davenport, I can tell you they are pretty excited with what we have announced in the budget. We have made prescriptions free for everyone under 25 and over 65. We've made tuition free for over 225 students. And now we've made childcare free for children aged two and a half until they are eligible for kindergarten. We know these investments will benefit all people in Ontario. Can the minister please provide more details on the Question. fiscal plan that supports these investments? Thank you. Minister Finance. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member from Davenport. And as you know, and she mentioned that this is our sixth budget, which I've had the privilege of delivering for the people of Ontario, and each year we plan for the long-term successes of this province. A balanced budget is by no means an end in itself. It's a means to an end. In the end, it's a stronger Ontario. That's why we're using our fiscal strength to invest more in our people and our businesses here in our province. We're investing more, but with fiscal prudence in mind. So we do have a path to balance. We have a prudent and sustainable plan to track back to balance, and at the same time, we ensure that we have a sufficient amount of prudence and reserves and contingencies for any shocks in the system. And we'll do it again, Mr. Speaker. We'll provide for a balanced approach, but not at the expense of the people of Ontario. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker, and back to the Minister of Finance. So I'm pleased that the Minister has chosen to invest in the care that Ontarians depend on, including the 225,000 students that are benefiting from free tuition, while creating more opportunities for the hardworking people of this province to share in our economic prosperity. I know that this government has a history of balancing investments with fiscal prudence, which is why I'm pleased to see that there is a path to balance, and I know Ontario's fiscal position remain strong. Without cutting and slashing the services that Ontarians depend on, in fact, many of the investments made in the budget will grow our economy by investing in the people of this province. Can the minister please remind this House what we are doing to create more opportunity in this province while balance, balancing fiscal prudence? Thank you. Minister. The member for Davenport has it right, Mr. Speaker. The government has always taken a fiscally responsible approach. We've invested wisely, bringing this province out of recession. And we've done this by investing and continuing to invest in Ontarians. That's why we're making sure that the peak deficit remains low at 0.8% of GDP. And we're taking more strategic investments like childcare and to provide more choice for Ontarians, more drug and dental programs to keep families healthier, as well as the Healthy Home Program for seniors so they can be more independent and more at longer, and invest nearly $1 billion over the next three years for goods, jobs, and growth plan. Through this, we will build our talent advantage, increase our business competitiveness, drive our trade and invest in our infrastructure to the tune of $230 billion over 14 years, a record level of investments that will build a legacy of opportunity for generations. And, sir, thank you. Your question, the member from the Parliament. Mr. Speaker, my question is as well to the Minister of Finance. Um, we are 69 days out from an Ontario election. Right now, the Liberals are touring the province on the tax paradigm, throwing money at everything that they ignored over the past 15 years. This government continues to show that they will say and do anything in order to cling to power. Just last year, the Wynn Liberals 
were committed and promised years of balanced budgets, yep. but yesterday they announced a $6.7 billion deficit, not for this year, but for this year, next year, the year after that, the year after that, the year after that, and likely to infinity if they continue to be in government. So my question, why is this government so committed to cling to power that they have thrown out any fiscal responsibility in their books, and Rush how does that minister look at his friends on Bay Street? So, Mr. Speaker, we have just come out of the the largest recession in our history. I, we've taken the appropriate steps not to make across-the-board cuts as advocated by the opposition. We've continued to move. Yeah. Member from Niagara West Glenbrook is warned. Carry on. And we slayed the deficit, we balanced the budget, and we have a surplus of $600 million. And now we have a choice before us, Mr. Speaker. As the economy is growing slower than anticipated, do we cut those very services and programs, or do we invest more in hospitals and roads and bridges, in schools and in child care? Do they want to cut the services that Ontarians depend upon and rely? Do they want to cut those programs that stimulate economic growth for the province? I say no, Mr. Speaker. No. We're going to invest, we're going to grow, yeah, yeah. and we're going to support the people of Ontario. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. I can fix his response for him, Speaker. What we really have in front of us is a $6.7 billion deficit. He has projected $14.4 billion in efficiencies, or as he likes to call them, cuts, and we have a $325 billion debt, and our debt interest payments are out of control. The Ontario credit card is maxed out thanks to that minister and that government. The Liberals had 15 years to fix all of these problems, but only now. 69 days before an election do they even want to pretend to fix them. We are ready to fight on this side of the aisle for hard-working Ontarians and put money back into the pockets of everyday people rather than take $2 billion of taxes out. So I ask the honourable member one more time, why doesn't this government help hard-working Ontario taxpayers and why do they continue to ring up deficit after deficit after deficit after deficit after deficit? After deficit? Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you. <laughs> Might be sooner than you think. Good idea. Have a coffee. No, no, decaf. <laughs> Minister. The member opposite wants us to want to remind us of the deficits that the progressive conservatives have led in this province. For over 40 years, there's only been eight balanced budget. Three were only from the president's were from the Conservatives. And the member is now criticizing that we're the leanest government anywhere in Canada because wow. of the transformations we make to be more productive. Wow. The member wants people to feel that it's wrong that we are the largest growth economy almost in the world. The member opposite doesn't like the fact that we have the lowest unemployment in two decades. We're almost at full capacity. The member opposite totally ignores that the GDP of our province is one of the largest in the world, and our debt to GDP is manageable, Mr. Speaker. Furthermore, she talks about the cost of that debt. I agree, and it's why we have taken the steps necessary to lower that overall cost, because when they were in power, 15 and a half cents of every dollar went to pay interest. Today, it's only eight cents, Mr. Speaker. You see it, please? You see it, please? Thank you. New question, the member from Nickelbelt. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. To the Minister of Finance. The people of Northeastern Ontario have been waited almost a decade for a PET scanner. Our community raised millions of dollars. We've done our part. Back in December 2015, this government promised to get a PET scan up and running in Sudbury. But today, we are still waiting. And yesterday's budget was one more disappointment in a long legacy of disappointment from this Liberal government. Why does the minister's final budget 
completely ignore the need for a PET scan to service the people of northeastern Ontario. Minister of Finance. Minister of Health. Mr. Phelps, well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And of course, uh, uh, I know this is an issue that has been of some concern to uh, the member opposite. Uh, but before I go into the details of uh, the PET scanner for Sudbury, I just want to say that I am so proud to be part of a government that is making a deliberate choice to invest and to continue to invest in care for the people of Ontario by investing more in health care, hospitals, home care, mental health, long term care, and indeed dental care. So, as it relates to uh, the Sudbury PET scanner, and I know our member uh, uh, from Sudbury has been very involved with this, a great advocate with uh, the former Minister of Health, uh, we have been investing some $4.6 million in capital spending to build additional space at the Health Sciences North for the new PET. Uh, CT scanner. And this is in addition to the $1.6 million that was announced in December 2015 to cover the operating Answer. costs for the scanner at Health Sciences North, which is still on track. Thank you, supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Since 2009, tens of thousands of people, of municipal leader, of First Nations leader, of uh, church leader, have been calling on this Liberal government to help us get a PET scanner in Sudbury. The San Bruno family, a grieving family, has done the impossible. They have raised over $4 million to purchase the scanner. Health Sciences North has done everything that you've asked them to do, but we are still waiting. Northerners have had to drive up to seven, eight hours on poorly maintained icy road all of last winter to get the care they needed in Southern Ontario. Why does this final budget does nothing to change that? and does nothing Question. to get a PET scanner up and running in Sudbury. Minister. Minister of Energy. Mr. Of Energy. Mr. Speaker, I'm very pleased to rise to talk about the PET scanner that we are getting in Sudbury. And yes, Mr. Oh. Speaker, that PET scanner is coming. And that is thanks to this government, Mr. Speaker. We worked. We worked with the community. We made sure that we listened to the concerns. And the community of Sudbury, Mr. Speaker, asked for a permanent pet scanner. And that's what our community is getting, not the mobile pet scanner that she advocated for, Mr. Speaker. We're making sure that we've got a permanent pet scanner. It's going to be on track, Mr. Speaker, and it's going to open up before the end of 2018, Mr. Speaker. I'm very proud of this government and our investments in health care and that the community of Sudbury is getting Answer. that pet scanner. Thank you. Any questions? The member from Barrie. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Yesterday, our government introduced a budget which includes significant investments in health care. In fact, the 2018 budget increases the health care spending by 5 per cent to reduce wait times, provide access to care, and enhance the patient experience. Most importantly, this budget includes funding for priority health care services that will have a real impact on Ontario families. Sure. Mr. Speaker, this budget invests in our hospitals, in mental health, in our long-term care homes, in home care, in our world-class health care professionals. Right. Mr. Speaker, we know that the people of Ontario want to age in their communities in the comforts of their homes. I myself have told my children I intend to be Questions? home until Steckley's funeral home comes to get me. Can the, can the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care please inform this House of the investments our government is making in home Thank and you. community care? Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and of course, thank you to the member from Barrie for giving me the opportunity to discuss our government's plan to provide more care at home and in the community. As our population ages, our government has made it a priority to improve home and community care so that patients can receive care in settings that are as comfortable and convenient for them as possible. And that's why we're investing $230 million in home and community care. And that means that there will be $2.8 million more 
four hours of personal support, the equivalent of 1,400 full-time positions, 284,000 more nursing visits, and 58,000 more therapy visits. We're also providing $175 million to create 20 new hospices within three years. I want to thank my parliamentary assistants for that initiative. Speaker, these investments will keep people out of hospital and help more people get the care they need Answer. at or close to home and in the community. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister, for that response, and thank you to the Minister and the Premier for all their hard work and dedication ensuring access to high-quality care across the health sector. Mr. Speaker, we all know how valuable our skilled, compassionate health care workers are. Our 2018 budget would provide an additional $822 million for hospitals to ensure that they have the resources to continue doing an incredible job for, of caring for our loved ones. It also provides $300 million over three years to increase staffing in long-term care homes. That means every long-term care home in the province will benefit from an additional registered nurse on staff. Mr. Speaker, we also heard yesterday that our government is investing in one of the largest groups in our health workforce, personal support workers. Speaker, can the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care please share with this House what our budget is proposing Question. to support PSWs? <laughs> Minister of Health. Well, thank you again to the member for that question. And I know the third party is particularly interested in this topic, as they asked a question on this uh, topic yesterday. We do know that critical, the, how critical PSWs are to the health and well-being of Ontarians. And as the population ages and more medically complex cli clients require care, the role of PSWs in our health care system will continue to be critical. And that is why, over the next three years, we will invest $23 million to add 5,500 PSWs to the workforce in underserviced communities, a $38 million training and education fund for new and existing existing PSWs will ensure that they have the tools they require to support our loved ones, and a $65 million investment over three years in retirement security for PSWs. It's so vital that we recognize and support PSWs as trusted and valued members of the health care team, and we're committed to supporting them to provide Answer. quality to care to the, our most vulnerable Ontarians wherever they may live. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. New question, the member from Wellington, Holton Hills. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of the Environment and Climate Change. Tucked away on the last page of the Budget Papers document tabled in this House yesterday, in fact, the last paragraph in the Budget Papers, was an indication that the government intends to, and I quote, amend the Climate Change Mitigation and Low Carbon Economy Act with respect to the reimbursement of expenditures incurred by the Crown for the purposes of funding initiatives that are reasonably likely to reduce or support the reduction of greenhouse gas, end quote. Reasonably likely? Give us a break. Will the minister finally admit that this is proof positive that their carbon tax policy is nothing more than a liberal slush fund? Thank you, Minister of the Environment and Climate Change. Well, thank you, uh, Speaker, and thank you to the member, thank you to the member opposite for uh, for that question. You know, when it comes to the uh, Green Investment Fund, uh, uh, Speaker, we take our responsibility uh, uh, very seriously. Uh, as we know, climate change, of course, is, is one of the most serious problems that our province and the world uh, is facing right now. Uh, that's why we uh, implemented our cap and trade uh, system. Uh, we've implemented the cap on pollution for businesses, and uh, we've uh, we've uh, allowed investments of uh, 1.9 billion dollars uh, this year in programs that help Ontario residents and businesses make affordable green choices. So, through the Green Ontario Investment Fund, uh, we're able to. Uh, help uh, businesses and consumers to save money and reduce their carbon footprint with things like uh, electric vehicle infrastructure and uh, retrofits for, for homes and social housing and schools and hospitals, colleges. Answer. Um, speaker, you know, what, uh, what I believe the uh, member opposite is talking about is a, is a minor accounting detail that was recommended to us by, the, uh, uh, by uh, public officials. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, the minister seems to be unaware of what is in the budget papers document. It's on page 307 of the budget papers document. I would suggest you look at it. Reasonably likely is subjective. It will mean different things to different people. 
For a Liberal government on its last legs, it is a loophole so large that they will want and they will try to drive a diesel-powered truck through it. Again, this confirms what we've been saying all along. The Liberal government carbon tax program is a Liberal slush fund. We know that they will say anything to stay in power. But today, will the minister finally acknowledge the truth to this House, that their carbon tax policy is more about revenue generation than reducing greenhouse gas emissions? Thank you. Minister. <coughs> to the uh, Minister of Finance, please. Minister of Finance. So, Mr. Speaker, let, let me reassure everyone in this House. This market approach to cap and trade has sourced over $2 billion for the province of Ontario to invest by law that we put in this House into green energy to reduce emissions. The members opposite in this House are choosing not to do that. They're choosing actually to do away with our leadership in this green business. <laughs> And the Auditor General has recommended this very approach that we've implied in that document. So we are abiding by the accounting principles, but more importantly, we're dedicating every dollar to green investments to reduce our emissions. And that's why the House should be supporting that too. Any question? Enter the third party. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Acting Premier. Desperate times call for desperate measures, and for the hundreds of workers uh, who work at Hamilton Specialty Bar in my community, their families, and hundreds of pensioners in my community, times are indeed desperate. Of course, you'd never know it reading the Liberal budget. Not once does it refer to the steel industry. Hamilton Specialty Bar faces liquidation if something isn't done to extend the negotiating window with a buyer who wants to keep making steel. Hamilton City Council passed a resolution last night to ask the Premier to take an active role, to step up to keep the mill uh, viable until the sale goes through. Will she, Speaker? Thank you. Minister of Economic Development and Growth. Thanks very much, uh, Speaker. I thank the uh, leader of the NDP for her question. I uh, understand uh, there are concerns that have been expressed regarding this very serious issue. I would say uh, that on this side of the House, we are disappointed, of course, to hear the news that's coming out of, uh, out, of, uh, out of Hamilton Specialty Bar. We have, as a government, been monitoring the situation uh, with respect to Hamilton Specialty Bar throughout the process of receivership. We will continue to work uh, with them as they go through this process and ensure that they have all of the resources necessary. I'd be happy to elaborate a little bit more in my follow-up answer to the supplementary. Thanks very much, Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, Speaker, it's action that's needed, not just monitoring. It's not just well-paying steel jobs that are in danger here. It's the pensions for hundreds more who gave their working lives to Hamilton Specialty Bar. But we've been here before, unfortunately. Still, there's no commitment from any level of Liberal government that pensioners go to the front of the line in the case of creditor liquidation. If steel and the thousands of auto sector jobs that depend on a viable made in Ontario steel industry were important to this Premier and her government. Why weren't they in the budget? Uh, thanks very much, Speaker. I thank uh, the leader of the NDP for the follow up question. I would say, as I said at the outset, that we will continue to monitor the situation and make sure that all the necessary steps are taken as the process unfolds, Speaker. I, but I would say, because the broader the broader context of the question deals with the steel industry and its health here in the province. And over the last number of weeks, as that particular industry, which employs indirectly and directly somewhere in the neighbourhood of 53,000 people across the province, including in Hamilton and the Sioux and elsewhere, obviously supports the thriving auto sector that we have here in this province. Speaker, this government and our premier, as we face threats, for example, from south of the border, uh, with the threat of having tariffs being applied by. Uh, the American yeah. administration on steel. This government was the government speaker yeah. that was fighting hard on this, yeah. that was relentlessly engaging with the Americans, that worked closely yeah. with our federal partners so that Canada was able to receive a qualified exemption. And as a result of those steps and many other speaker, we were able to celebrate the fact for the time being that we have that qualified exemption. In the meantime, this premier, our finance minister and all government will stand up for our workers and our businesses, including in our domestic steel industry speaker, and we'll continue to monitor the situation with Hamilton Bar, and I appreciate the question from the leader of the NDP. Thank you, thank you very much. New question, the member from Trinity Spadina. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Transportation. 
Yesterday, our Minister of Finance introduced Ontario's 2018 budget. Speaker, this budget includes an unprecedented $79 billion commitment to transit over the next 14 years. This money will go to delivering critical transit projects right across the province. Speaker, this budget clearly lays out our plan for care and opportunity. When I speak to my uh, constituents about what opportunity means to them, affordability is always top of mind. For many commuters in the city of Toronto, taking transit is a necessity, but it's it's it also comes with a cost. Members in my community are concerned about overcrowding in Toronto transit system. They want to see real relief, and a huge part of that is providing affordable alternatives to uh, Toronto's local transit network. Speaker, would the minister Question? please provide the member of this house with more information on how Budget 2018 will help making transit in the city of Toronto more affordable? Thank you. Minister of Transportation. Thank you, Speaker, and I want to thank the member from Trinity Spadina for his unwavering commitment to delivering real results for his community. Our government knows that we need to keep making transit a more convenient option for commuters, and a critical part of that is making it more affordable. That's why I'm so pleased that Budget 2018 includes our government's commitment to reducing GO and UP Express fares for travel within the City of Toronto to just $3 on a Presto card. This will take effect in early 2019 and put GO and UP Express fares in line with adult TTC fares, which will help make GO and UP Express a real choice for commuters traveling within the City of Toronto. Not only will this make our transit network more affordable, we know that it will also help address capacity challenges on the TTC network. So whether it's building new transit or leaving more money in the pocket of commuters, our government's absolutely committed to improving your commute, whether you live in Etobicoke, Scarborough, Liberty Village, or the downtown core. This will make a real difference to transit Answer. commuters. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. I want to thank the minister for the answer. I'm pleased to uh, hear about our government's commitment to make our transit network more affordable. Speaker, I know the fare integration is top priority for our team at the Ministry of Transportation. An existing approach to fare in our region is complex, and finding a solution requires a significant amount of planning and cooperation. Our government has taken a number of measures to reduce barriers and making commuting across this region simpler and more affordable. Most recently, prior to the budget 2018, we introduced a $1.50 discount for transit riders transferring between Go Transit or the Up Express or the TTC. Metrolinx has found that Go Transit and Up Express and TTC transfers grew by 23% wow. in both January and February 2018. Compared news. to 2017 total, it's a significant increase. This discount will, is helping to save commuters on average $720 per year. Wow. Speaker, can the minister please provide more Washington. information to the member of this House how Budget 2018 will help make it easier to move between the different transit systems thank in you. our region? Thank you. Minister. Speaker, and thank you to the member from Trinity Spadina for his question. So, in addition to the $3 flat fares for GO and UP Express trips within the City of Toronto, our government is also reducing the cost of taking the GO for transit rider at a number of stations across the GTHA. We are also creating a $3 flat fare for GO trips that are less than 10 kilometres. These changes will come into effect also in early 2019 and will be making, uh, will make taking transit a much better option for commuters deciding to uh, between taking their car to work or hopping on the GO. We've also heard that a major challenge for commuters is having to pay two full fares when using both the TTC and their local transit service in the 905. That's why, as committed in Answer. Budget 2018, we'll work with the TTC and a number of local transit agencies to introduce real discounts to transit users who transfer between the municipal transit networks. New question, the member from Bruce Gray, Owen South. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is the acting premier. Premier Wynne once said, and I quote, I think everyone here knows that eliminating the deficit is the most important thing we can do to move to economic growth. Mr. Speaker, if that's the case, why is the Premier running six straight years of deficits? Thank you. Minister Finance. So, Mr. Speaker, we uh, have balanced the budget. We've slayed the deficit. We have a surplus of $600 million. And going forward, everyone in this House has a choice to make. Do we continue to 
uh, not build and invest in the things that matter to the people of Ontario, given that our growth in our economy is more tempered than when we anticipated? Do we continue to not to build in prudence and reserves and contingencies to ensure that we do not find ourselves in a position where we are not able to defend for those most in need? We have chosen to make those investments at less than 0.8 per cent of our GDP so that we can continue to support them and grow our economy. And that's exactly what we're doing. We're putting more money in people's pockets. We're helping our young families succeed. We're ensuring our seniors have better care. And we're going to continue to support child care up to $17,000 for child so that they too can get a better start in life. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Speaker. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Again, back to the acting premier. And the people inside and outside the House will have a choice of whether to trust a government that continues to break promises year after year. Premier Wynne said, and I quote again, I actually believe that fiscal prudence and a strong economy are connected. I think that they are absolutely connected, and that's why we have remained committed to our elimination of the deficit. Fiscal prudence, strong economy, not what comes to mind when people think about this Liberal government. In fact, they're going to drive our debt up to $400 billion. Mr. Speaker, what happened to fiscal prudence and a strong economy? You, Minister. And Mr. Speaker, we have built in fiscal prudence and we have a strong economy. Here, 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 here. The fact of the matter is we outpaced Canada and the G7 and, and the majority of the United States. And that's only because of the investments that we made to stimulate that growth. Unlike the member opposite, who would have us slash those investments, not make the investments in infrastructure like roads and bridges, schools and hospitals, or high-speed rail or broadband that we're now introducing in this budget wow. to make our rural community stronger, Mr. Speaker. They're going to go vote against those very measures. And we will continue to support our families, put for and support mental health and addiction, and more supports for hospitals, more supports for our seniors' care. All of these things matter and enables people to have a greater opportunity to share in the prosperity that this province now enjoys. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Speaker. The member from Windsor West. Thank you, Speaker. To the acting premier. Recently, this Liberal government decided that auto workers should have fewer emergency leave days and scheduling protections than every other worker in Ontario. Shame. Yesterday, we learned there is no auto strategy in Budget 2018. Shame. There are workers in Windsor, Oshawa, Cambridge, Woodstock, Brampton, Peterborough, St. Catharines, and across the province who are left wondering why this Liberal government chose to neglect them yet again. Auto workers deserve a comprehensive plan for the sector that will protect jobs and growth in our communities. They deserve a government that supports and respects them. Speaker, should we assume that the Liberals are simply adopting the old Conservative mentality to just let the auto sector die? Minister of Labour, Mr. Speaker. Minister of Labour. Rich from that Speaker, country. thank you. Uh, thank you very much for that question, Speaker. And I don't think there's Rich any government in the history of the province of Ontario what about that's Jerry done Dyess? more Beautiful. to ensure that we have a stable, secure auto sector in this province, Speaker. The job creation ratio that goes along with that sector is one that's appreciated, Speaker, by all members on this side of the House. Right. The investments we've made in that are proof positive, Speaker. We Jerry? work along with Unifor. We work along with the, uh, the, uh, the parts plant, Speaker. Yes. And I don't think there's any better evidence than yesterday when the budget was presented, one of the most uh, one of the people that was most outspoken in praise of this budget, yes. Speaker, was Jerry Dias, Speaker, President the President of the Auto Workers Union. The speaker, if you want clear indication, he was telling us this is a very socially progressive budget. Nobody understands auto like, like Unifor, Speaker. I think we've done a tremendous job ensuring that Ontario has a stable economy and auto is a huge part of that, Speaker. Thank you, Speaker. The minister can talk about respecting the auto sector, but I have received hundreds of emails, phone calls, and petitions from auto workers across Ontario. They have told me that they have contacted the Premier. They have contacted the Minister of Labour, even Conservative members in their writings. But the uh, Liberal government's discriminatory about the Liberal government's discriminatory regulation, and they have been ignored. No response. Only New Democrats have been standing in solidarity with these workers. 
On April 22nd, thousands of these auto workers are coming to Queen's Park. They are rallying to show this Liberal government just how fed up they are with being pushed aside. I'll be there, and other New Democrats will be there. Speaker, will the Premier, the Minister of Labour, or anyone in this Liberal government be here on April 22nd to meet the auto workers and explain why they chose to discriminate against them? Minister. Speaker, the Minister of Economic Development and Growth. Minister of Economic Development and Growth. Uh, thanks very much, Speaker. I uh, want to take a moment to echo what the Minister of Labour said in response to the first question about not only the ongoing and incredible support that our government has provided to Ontario's auto sector, but also what that success has meant for our economy, Speaker. So, for example, since 2004, our government has invested $1.42 billion in auto, leveraging $16.4 billion and creating a retaining speaker more than 82,000 jobs. Wow. Those are jobs, Speaker. Wow. We've also helped to attract investment yeah. since fall 2016, including investments at Chrysler and Ford's facilities in Windsor, Speaker, in Woodstock and in St. Catharines and in Honda's facility in Alliston, not to mention the rest of the supply chain, Speaker, which we know employs tens of thousands of other skilled Ontarians. I would say, Speaker, in 2017, for example, yes, we know over 100,000 direct jobs in the auto manufacturing sector, vehicle assembly and parts. This is why we specifically make these investments, Speaker, and I look forward to continuing to work closely with all aspects of the auto sector so we can continue to thrive. <clears throat> Mind the memory of when I stand, you sit, and also that we're still in warnings. New question, the member from Kingston and the Islands. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Seniors Affairs. As I'm sure you know, seniors make up the fastest growing segment of Ontario's population, and today there are more than 2 million seniors in our province, and that number is expected to double in the next 25 years. Seniors have spent a lifetime contributing to their communities and to the economy. They continue to do tremendous work, as is the case with seniors in my riding of Kingston and the Islands. We need a government that is willing to make impactful investments in care so our seniors have the supports they need to live healthy and active, independent, safe and socially connected lives. This government knows seniors are wanting to remain in their homes for as long as they can, like my colleague from Barrie. Last November, your ministry announced $155 million in investments to support aging with confidence, Ontario's action plan for seniors. Mr. Speaker, would the Question. Minister of Seniors Affairs explain to this House how the budget of 2018 continues to invest in care for Ontario seniors? Thank you. Minister Responsible Senior Affairs. Uh, thank you, Speaker. I want to begin by thanking the member from Kingston and Islands for this very important question and for giving me the opportunity, Mr. Speaker, to discuss how our government is choosing to continue to invest in care for our seniors. In November of last year, Mr. Speaker, we announced the Aging with Confidence, a $155 million plan for seniors. But at that point, Mr. Speaker, I had made it very clear that that was just the beginning and that there was more more to come, and we've kept our promise, Mr. Speaker, and I'm so proud that yesterday in our 2018 budget, we took another step in ensuring that seniors can continue to live in their own homes for as long as they can, as the member from Barry so passionately um, talked about. And that's why, Mr. Speaker, the new yes, Seniors sir. Healthy Home Program will provide up to $750 wow. annually to seniors aged 75 years or older for every eligible household. Thank you. But nice, nice try. Uh, nice try. <laughs> I go by the clock. I beg to inform the House that, pursuant to Standing Order 71B, the member from Nipissing has notified the clerk of his intention to file notice of a reasoned amendment to the motion for second reading of Bill 31, an act to implement budget measures and to enact and amend various statutes. The order for second reading of Bill 31 may therefore not be called today. Recognize the member from Carleton, Mississippi Mills, on a point of order. Mr. Speaker, it gives me great pleasure to introduce guests of the Trillium Party of Ontario. We have two candidates. We have Lucy Guerrero, representing Humber River Black Creek. We have George Garvita, Scarborough Guildwood. We have supporters of theirs, Hilda Sembrano, Marco Garcia Ramirez, 
Rich Persad, Alyu Muyawa Aji Bolade, Gilda Trinidad, Silva Beatriz, Maria Pasnino, Robert Arias, Susanna Giron, Edith Atolin, Antolin, Rosario Sanchez, and Norma Lanuza. Welcome. Thank you. Member from Sault Ste. Marie on a point of order. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I am very uh, honoured uh, to, uh, to invite uh, today and welcome to the Legislature a special guest, uh, Michigan State Senator uh, Wayne uh, Schmidt in the uh, rear of the gallery and his uh, wife, Kathleen Shannon, and uh, his two sons, Ryan and Daniel. Welcome to Queen's Park. I have a uh, I have a sad announcement to make. We, I I really don't like making this announcement, but I have to make this announcement. I have to inform you that this is the last day for our pages. We want to thank them for their hard work in such a short period of time and their wonderful work here at the legislature. And finally, I wish all of you an opportunity to come together with your families during Easter and all of the other holy days that are celebrated during this month and this week, and I wish you have some time with your family. God bless you all. Therefore, there are no deferred votes. This House stands recessed until 1 p.m. this afternoon.